Monday was day four of the so-called Love Triangle murder trial, formerly known as Texas versus Caitlin Armstrong. This is the case where the defendant is accused of shooting her romantic rival, who was a professional cyclist, and then fleeing to Costa Rica to dye her hair and get plastic surgery to evade capture. If you're not familiar with this case, I am linking in the description below to a playlist of all of the videos that I've made on this case so far. This includes the live stream of the opening statements, as well as recaps for days one through three. And I'll be continuing to post recaps on this trial all the way up until closing arguments when the court will once again allow cameras in the courtroom. We will be live streaming those closing arguments as well as the verdict right here on this channel with legal commentary. Anyway, the trial has been ongoing in Austin, Texas since opening statements kicked off on November 1st. And on day four, the jury once again heard from Colin Strickland, the boyfriend in this so-called love triangle. And then after Colin's testimony ended, the jury also heard from a few more witnesses to include a couple of friends of his as well as a detective who also investigated this case. In hindsight, it kind of makes sense that Colin's testimony would be sandwiched between other witnesses in this trial, despite the fact that he is a key witness here. Normally, when you have a star witness or a key witness, you want them to be either among the very first of the witnesses or among the very last of the witnesses in your case in chief. This is because of the so-called primacy and recency effect. When the human brain is taking in information, especially a lot of information, especially in a circumstance like this in a trial, something very interesting happens. When it comes to recalling information, Information, the jury tends to remember details from things that were presented either first or last. And things in the middle tend to get a little bit more fuzzy. And so why would the prosecution kind of be okay with the jury maybe getting a little bit fuzzy on Colin's testimony? One answer to this is simple inconsistencies. And Colin's got a few inconsistencies that were highlighted by the defense on day four. In this video, we're going to go over some of them and we're going to talk a little bit about some of Colin's out of court behavior that is less than ideal. I'll explain that part in a moment. But now the most pressing question is, are the inconsistencies in Colin's testimony bad enough to start shifting things in favor of the defendant? Remember that the defense has every interest in pinning Moe's death on literally anyone other than Caitlin. And that includes Colin. So watch this video until the very end and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Okay, so like I said, day four started with Colin finishing up his testimony. And I mentioned this in day three, but his posture and manner of speaking has been notably defeated seeming. He's apparently basically kept his head bowed, he's not making eye contact, he's keeping his eyes low, and he apparently on day three was speaking barely above a whisper. And that didn't seem to change all that much on day four, except that I guess he had a little bit more strength in his voice on day four. Anyway, the state started day four by asking asking about Caitlin's sister, Christy. Colin said that he believed that Christy was living in New York at the time that Mo was killed. Remember that she's going to be coming up importantly in the story because she apparently is the person that Caitlin first went to when she left Texas. Anyway, they also touched on the actual guns that the two of them owned in their Texas home. Colin said that he's never fired either of the guns that he and Caitlin bought, but he said that he knows that Caitlin has because she's shown him photos of herself on the gun range firing them. Next, they went into the subject of the blocked numbers in Colin's phone. Colin said that he never blocked any of these individuals that were brought up by the state. And so it sounds like this was a bit of a peculiarity when he realized that these people were blocked. To illustrate this, the court brought in text messages between Colin and Mo from January 7th, 2022, when they realized that Mo was somehow blocked on Colin's phone. After this, they introduced more text messages, this time from April 11th, 2022, also between Colin and Mo. Here they were talking about Colin's travel and training in California. Mo asked him about cycling rules and strategy, and Colin said in court that this was the kind of essentially shop talk that they would engage in. Then they showed more text messages between Mo and Colin, this time starting on May 10th, 2022, the day before Mo was killed. One of the texts showed that she reached out to him, letting him know that she was in Austin, and then they essentially talk about what they're up to and then make plans to get together. And I have to say, from what I can see, what's presented in these text messages is all fairly tame and almost boring. There's nothing in here that seems like they're flirting or they're being in any way less than friendly or professional. It's basically just two friends getting together, talking, shop, etc. And it continues to the next day throughout the day on May 11th, 2022, until they connected in person and Colin picked her up at Cash's apartment. The only part that really sticks out here is when the state shows that Colin had changed Mo's name in his phone to Christine Wall. Now, after this, the state introduced more text messages, but this time they were between Colin and Caitlin. First, they showed texts showing them talking about investment strategies since Caitlin was managing his business and his account. 
accounts. These are important texts that illustrate the fact that she was very involved, not just in his social media accounts and things like that, but also in his finances. After this, they show texts from October 28th, 2021. There's a text from Caitlin that says, I know you know better than to show up at Meteor with that girl. Aside from that, enjoy your Eve. Apparently, she was talking about Mo. And Meteor is apparently a very popular cycling cafe in South Austin. Colin's response was, could you please be an adult? He said in court that he perceived this as childish behavior. And then he texted Caitlin back again saying, Mo left for Meteor with friends an hour ago. I'm not going to go because I'm trying to respect you. So he apparently never went to Meteor that day. But then on the same day at 8.05 p.m., Colin texts Caitlin again. He says, did you call Mo? WTF, can you talk? I need to understand what's going on. But she responds, sorry, I can't talk right now. This definitely suggests that some sort of funny business is going on. If she didn't call Mo, it kind of makes a little bit more sense for her to be like, what in the world are you talking about? But she notably doesn't deny calling Mo. That, of course, is not foolproof evidence that she did in fact call Mo, but it's notable. So she may in fact have been engaging in this kind of harassing behavior going back to October 2021. Anyway, then there was more of this on March 12th, 2022, when Caitlin texts Colin, send my love to Pete and Mo. This text was in response to a video that Colin had posted on Instagram of a finish of his in which Mo was somewhere in the background. And with that, I have to make another another correction to something that I said in a previous recap. I had thought that Caitlin had publicly commented with that statement on the Instagram post, but apparently she texted that to him, which obviously is way more private. It is still passive aggressive in my personal opinion, but it's more behind closed doors. But either way, I want to be as accurate as possible in these recaps, so I'm going to note when I catch some sort of an error that I've made or an error in information that I've been given. And speaking of errors, here's another one. <laughs> So I said in the day three alibi that on May 11th, 2022, Colin texted Caitlin an alibi. I thought his alibi text was that he was bringing marijuana to a friend in North Austin for some kind of pain management. But on day four, they showed a text from Colin saying something different about this alibi. The text from Colin reads, hey, are you out? I went to drop some flowers for Allison at her son's house up north and my phone died heading home unless you have another food suggestion. Now, of course, it could be that flowers is a euphemism for marijuana, but if not, either that was an inconsistency from Colin or the reporting out of the courtroom, or maybe I got it wrong. I'm not entirely sure. I am more prone to believe that the error was either in the reporting or in my personal recall. Anyway, then the court showed more text messages, this time between Colin and a friend named Lance Tyndall on May 12th, 2022, the day after Mo's death. The jury also heard from Lance himself on day four, so these texts are a precursor to his testimony later in the day. Basically, they were texting about some bicycle wheels that Lance was buying from Colin. And then Lance also texts Colin later on, sorry your day started with such awful news, send me your Venmo or I can drop off cash. Apparently, Colin had spoken with Lance briefly from his car when Colin was heading to the police department for his interview. Now, after these text messages, the state ended with showing an email that Colin had sent to Caitlin on May 13th, where he said, did you get a phone? I activated my number. So this is sort of corroboration about what Colin had said about the two of them feeling paranoid after the police had started to come in and investigate, feeling like they were being sort of recorded or listened to or surveyed and wanting to get new phones. Okay, then the defense started their cross-examination. And as I said at the end of the day three recap, this cross-examination was bound to be a tough one. This is especially because the defense has every reason to pin Mo's death on Colin to create reasonable doubt in this trial. And in the case of any witness, cross-examination is typically where the rubber meets the road. It's where a witness's account gets tested to see if there are any inconsistencies or whether there are any parts of the testimony that somehow seem unreasonable. It's also where the other side will often bring in more context that will sort of reframe the witness's testimony. As we watch more and more trials on this channel together, we can see how a witness can start off looking like an absolute superstar on direct examination, only to be completely dismantled on cross-examination. We've been seeing a lot of this in the 1993 Menendez brothers trial that we've been going through on Mondays with our series classic trials. But anyway, on the other hand, when a witness's testimony holds up well on cross, it can be absolutely devastating to the other side. I'm thinking of notable witnesses like Isaac Baruch in the Depp v. Heard trial. Again, do you know whether she was wearing any amica cream? <laughs> sir, if you could just answer I'm the sorry. question. I'm totally sorry. I'm Thank sorry. You, sir. That, uh, no. Anyway, the defense started off here asking, 
basically who Colin had talked to about the case over the weekend, other than his attorney or prosecutors or the like. And apparently Colin responded with, I have no effing idea. He used the full word, I'm self-censoring for YouTube. But as you can see, things started off a little bit prickly. Anyway, the defense then quickly turns to this idea that Caitlin was jealous of Mo. And so the defense asked Colin about other instances where Caitlin and Mo were in the same vicinity as one another. For example, a race in January 2022 in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Colin admitted that there was no jealousy present or at least expressed there, but that Caitlin had an issue with some kind of an unrelated real estate dispute. And then we start to see the introduction of a lot of I don't recalls. Now, we always want to see a witness testifying to the best of their abilities. And if their memory gets fuzzy on some things and they don't remember what happened, it's best to just testify that you don't remember what happened. So on its own, testifying I don't recall isn't suspicious or improper, but it can get overused and create an impression that the witness is being evasive, or at the very least, unhelpful. And I'll say Colin has probably every reason to give Caitlin's attorney a hard time. I'm sure that over the past year and a half or whatever, Colin has been absolutely through the ringer. I already talked in a previous recap about how he has lost sponsorships, but he apparently has also been somewhat hounded by the media. And of course, one other source of this stress is undoubtedly Caitlin's attorney. Just as an example of Colin's use of I don't recall, When the defense asked him, do you claim that you would receive some messages from Mo Wilson, but not all of your messages, Colin responded with, I don't recall. But then he says he never blocked Mo, but recognized that at some point that she had been blocked. So it seems like he doesn't really need to use I don't recall in that situation because he kind of recalls the fact that he was maybe getting some messages, maybe not. So this looks to me like Colin is using it as a little bit of a defense mechanism on the stand. On the one hand, I can empathize because testifying as a witness, just as a default matter, it can be very intimidating. And cross-examination is especially so. And as I've belabored the point, he has also been absolutely through hell and back through this case personally. But on the other hand, the jury might start framing his testimony with some amount of suspicion if they feel like he's being evasive. But aside from that, the defense catches a first inconsistency here. And this is the subject of Caitlin's behavior regarding Mo and what Colin told the police about this subject. Specifically, the defense asked Colin why he never told the police that Caitlin had blocked Mo in his phone. And Colin's response essentially was, you got me. Basically, no explanation. Then the defense went over all of the contacts that were blocked in Colin's phone. There apparently were 71 in total. Given that he's a well-known professional cyclist in the cycling world, I can understand why he may have a need to block numbers from time to time. And apparently some of these were in fact blocked by Colin himself. But when the defense asked whether that number was upwards of 60 contacts that he himself had blocked, he says he can't recall or confirm. So, Maybe. The reason why this is potentially important is because it shows that he at least did on some occasion block some numbers. And it also shows that it's not like the only numbers that were blocked on his phone were female friends. So A, there's a chance that Colin could have blocked Mo by accident, and B, the pattern of blocking numbers on his phone is a little bit more broad than previously presented by the prosecution. The defense also pointed to a part of Colin's May 11th timeline where he had testified that he hadn't yet heard from Mo that day. And so the defense pulled up a text message that Mo had sent to Colin earlier in the day. This is another inconsistency. That said, Colin explained that he had already been on a bike ride when the text came in, so he didn't see it until later. So in his mind, he had not yet been contacted by Mo. So this particular inconsistency may be more of a problem of semantics rather than substance. Next, the defense asked him if basically Colin was sexting with Mo, and he asked if Colin understands the term and whatnot. And the defense also brought up that semi-nude photo that another woman had sent him, which I mentioned in the day three recap. And this subject seemed to get under Colin's skin a little bit. And that seems to be what the defense was going for here. Now, witnesses have to understand something when they are going in to testify, either in a deposition or at trial, that there is always a very good chance that the cross-examining attorney or the opposing attorney uh, is going to try to get under their skin. This is especially true of a witness like this who is kind of fair game based on the nature of his testimony. And the purpose of this is basically to get the witness off balance. This has the potential effect of causing the witness to possibly admit to things against their own interest or to make them look bad in front of the jury so that the jury kind of discounts their testimony. Anyway, like I said, the defense digs into this semi-nude photo. As it turns out, this other photo sent by this other woman was of her in in a bra. So that doesn't make me feel any better about this photo beyond what I had already expressed in the day three recap. The defense asked Colin, rightly in my opinion, 
Would you agree that sending a picture of yourself in a bra would signal some sort of romantic or intimate relationship? Of course, it doesn't really matter what he says in response to this question. This is more a question posed to the jury for them to think about to dislike Colin a bit. Talking further about the photo, Colin said that he didn't tell Caitlin about the photo and he also did not discourage the photo. But for some reason, he said that he thinks that it was unfair for Caitlin to be upset over it. And to be clear, Colin testified on day three that all of this went down when he and Caitlin were dating. The only way that I could possibly agree with Colin here is if the photo was sent to him when he and Caitlin were on a break and he just continued the friendship with the woman when he and Caitlin got to back together and it did not continue in any sort of a romantic sort of way. But I don't see any kind of explanation like that here. All I see here is Colin being a little bit obdurate and saying, Caitlin had no right to be upset over a photo like this, which I never discouraged from the other woman. I don't like it. Maybe he doesn't see it, but this is precisely the kind of attitude that can send an insecure woman off into the deepest depths of insecurity. Again, I am not saying that Colin is responsible for Moe's death here. That responsibility falls squarely on Caitlin's shoulders as the evidence appears to me currently in this moment. Of course, I can change my opinion based on evidence that continues to unfold in the trial, but for the moment, that is how things appear to be. But, you know, Colin did play a role in all of this. But after this, the defense gets into a more important part of his testimony. This has to do with the other stuff that was found in their home during the execution of the search warrant. This is the stuff like the two firearms, a bunch of ammunition, the passports, the cash, etc. Specifically, Caitlin's 9mm Sig Sauer is important because it matches the shell casings that were found at the crime scene. Obviously, although it is Caitlin's gun, there's the question of access to the gun. Colin is naturally someone that had access to it since he lived in the same home as Caitlin. But here on Colin's cross-examination, the defense asked about the access that other people had to Colin's home. As it turns out, his home is locked at all entrances with a key code. And the defense suggested to Colin that he had shared that key code with at least 33 other people. Colin doesn't fully confirm this, but he said it's possible. And then what came up on cross was that Colin had a fairly regular habit of allowing his friends to access his home for various reasons, even without him or Caitlin even being there themselves. So this does open up the case a little bit for the defense to introduce some potential reasonable doubt. Because if other people had fairly regular free access to his home, other people also at least had the opportunity to access and use the Sig Sauer. That said, Opportunity is one thing, but it's still up to the defense to introduce some measure of likelihood that someone else, in fact, did use the Sig Sauer. Because otherwise, the idea that Caitlin used her own Sig Sauer to shoot Mo still seems like the most reasonable outcome here. Now, after this, there apparently was a bit of a dramatic moment in the courtroom, and this to me suggests the level of cold animosity that Colin may feel for Caitlin at this point. The defense attorney asked Colin, you know Caitlin very well, don't you? This seems like a reasonable question given that they dated for several years and even lived together under the same roof. But Colin's response surprisingly was, no, I do not. Apparently there was an audible gasp in the room. Like I said, Dramatic. Anyway, another thing that came out was Caitlin's apparent calmness on the evening of May 11th and on May 12th. Colin said that when he revealed to Caitlin on the 12th that he had been with Mo the night before, Caitlin did not seem upset about it. Honestly, personally, this makes me suspect Caitlin even more. When we're looking at a witness's behavior, we start to see natural patterns of behavior emerge. And although the defense is suggesting that Caitlin was not jealous of Mo, by showing times, for example, when she was not outwardly projecting jealousy, I think that there's been enough introduced in evidence to show that Caitlin was in fact jealous of Mo. So it seems that when Colin revealed this fact to Caitlin that he had been with Mo the night before, Caitlin would be upset or at the very least surprised. If she's being calm about this in this moment, to me it suggests that A, either she knew about it already, maybe because she was stalking them, and or B, it didn't matter to her because Mo was no longer a threat to her. In my opinion, that answer is not great for the defense. However, the defense did elicit some pieces of information that were helpful to the defense. Remember that in opening statements, the defense suggested that weird things had happened at their home after Mo's death. They said this to give an alternative explanation to the jury for why Caitlin fled to Costa Rica. Here, Colin testified that about 24 hours after Mo was killed, there was an incident of vandalism. 
His motorcycle was pushed into Caitlin's Jeep, and someone pushed over some stone pavers in his driveway. He also found two $1 bills nearby. Colin apparently took some photos of it and submitted it to Austin police and suggested that he thought it was a homeless person. But of course, the defense would love for the jury to think that this is some other person that is now sort of tormenting Caitlin and Colin after Moe's death. Anyway, the next thing that the defense got out of Colin was his previous opinion that the police were trying to push a narrative. This is important because this is kind of the closest thing that the defense really has to a theme to their case. And so having this theme come out of an opposing witness is always a good thing. Specifically, Colin said that he felt like the detectives were trying to lead him along and it made him very upset. Then again, it is also very explainable why he would subjectively feel this way if he was the suspect at that point. He could very very well have felt a lot of pressure from the police while they actively investigated him. And that subjective feeling may have changed when that interest shifted over to Caitlin. After this, the defense wanted to get into Colin's use of the word tumultuous to describe his relationship with Caitlin. The defense attorney literally brought out a Merriam-Webster definition that includes things like verbal assault, physical assault, etc. And so Colin basically agreed that maybe tumultuous isn't the best word to use to describe it. Honestly, I don't think he needed to backtrack here though. Colloquially, we all understand tumultuous to also mean an experience that has been very widely varying in emotional highs and lows. And so Colin could have explained that this was what he meant when he used the word tumultuous. So this to me suggests that he probably was getting somewhat ground down by cross-examination at this point. Now, another thing that he said that is maybe not going to make much of a difference for anyone in the trial, but is maybe not a great look for him personally, is the reasons he wasn't sure about dating Caitlin long-term. The thing that he said bothered him, I guess, most was her clothing, something he called fast fashion. Honestly, I had to look this term up because, I don't know, maybe I'm not with it or something, but I, I had never heard of this term before. Feel free to make fun of me for the fact that I was unfamiliar. <laughs> Anyway, apparently it's fashion that is stylish but inexpensive and intended to meet the fast pace of fashion changes. It's usually made of cheap, sometimes toxic textiles or dyes, and apparently one cause of massive pollution. Examples of this apparently include stores like Zara and H&M. I'm not sure what aspect of Caitlyn's fast fashion Colin didn't like. Maybe it was the environmental effects, or maybe it was the overall cheapness of it, but it is kind of a strange thing to point to when it comes to someone's calculation of relationship longevity. A secondary thing that he kind of talked about was their seemingly lack of shared interests. Remember that Colin testified on day three that Caitlin had picked up cycling through his encouragement and through their relationship. Well, Caitlin seems to be a big yoga enthusiast and apparently Colin was not willing to do the same with yoga even though it is her passion. He testified in court that he had no interest in yoga. Now, he is a professional cyclist, and so it's natural that that is going to be his main interest. I mean, it literally is his job. But it is kind of wild that he never went to a single yoga class or yoga session with Caitlin when she invited him throughout the course of their relationship. I just have this impression at this point, like he really was not invested at all in this relationship with her to begin with. But anyway, more points in favor of the defense emerged here. Colin said that when they broke up in October 2021, he knew that Caitlin spontaneously flew to Mexico because she was upset. For one thing, this suggests that it was common for her to spontaneously travel internationally, especially when upsetting things happened. It also might explain the 90 pesos or whatever that were found during the search warrant execution. Colin also testified that Caitlin had on occasion traveled to places like Bali, Indonesia, Singapore, Iceland, and Thailand, and some of those places were travel that she did specifically for yoga. But anyway, here we get into some more inconsistencies, and these seem to be the biggest ones, the ones that the defense really wants to leave the jury with at the very end, the ones that'll leave the biggest impression. First, remember that when Colin said that Caitlin moved in, they never intended it to be permanent, but it kind of just ended up that way. Well, on cross-examination, he admitted that she never manipulated him into staying or into moving in in the first place. So it sounds like this never intended to be permanent kind of thing may have been a private thought that he had, but maybe never communicated to Caitlin. He also testified that when he and Caitlin broke up in October 2021, he intended that breakup to be final. But on cross, the defense attorney pulled up a segment of his police interrogation where he told the police that his breakup was 
just a blip. In other words, a super temporary breakup, the opposite of a final one. Then the defense brought up another segment where Colin told the police on May 12th that he did not know Mariah Wilson very well. Colin explained to the jury that he and Mo had spent very little time together in person while she was alive. But what he said to the police doesn't appear to be honest to me based on the text that we've seen shared between them, despite the fact that most of their time was not spent in person. Anyway, then the defense brought up another portion where Colin told the police that Caitlin was a wonderful person. She was very sweet and very compassionate and not a particularly jealous person, but that Detective Spittler was the one who was pushing that narrative. Obviously, this is very different than what Colin was saying in his direct examination. And to kind of shore this up a bit, the defense compares the prosecution's narrative about Caitlin's jealousy with Mo with how she was around Colin's other female cycling friends. These were one woman named Morgan Rojas and a woman named Virginia. Colin agrees that Caitlin was never jealous of either of them and even had Virginia over once to celebrate Caitlin's birthday. Although I will point out that it's entirely possible that Caitlin was not jealous of all women that Colin encountered, but just Mo. That on its own is enough for this case because Mo is the one who was shot by someone on May 11th, 2022. After all, Mo was apparently one of the best cyclists in the game, and it could be that Colin displayed real admiration for her when he talked about her, which could have triggered Caitlin's insecurities. Also, there's a big inconsistency about the guns that they purchased. On direct, Colin made it sound like Caitlin was the one who was pushing to buy the guns. But on cross, Colin admits that he bought them and she did not manipulate him into buying them. And in fact, it was his idea to buy them. In his opinion at the time, all women should have guns. That's something that he says he's changed his mind about apparently, and that is understandable. But he also admitted that after purchasing the guns, Colin encouraged her to train with them and to learn how to use them. I said at the beginning of this trial that it's not necessarily suspicious that Caitlin got a gun in December 2021. And honestly, at this point, I'm fairly convinced that the purchase and training with the gun was not part of some kind of grand scheme to hunt down Mo. So at this point, I do think that the prosecution was overselling that point a bit to a point that they really did not need to. In my opinion, the dynamic in the relationship between Caitlin and Colin was that Caitlin was very invested in the relationship and Colin was not. Caitlin was willing to get involved in Colin's interests and partake in the things that were important to him and to take his suggestions on various things and Colin was not willing to reciprocate. So this idea that the prosecution is trying to push to the jury that she had some kind of master plan to do with the guns I personally don't buy it, but I do still think that based on the rest of the evidence that's been presented so far, Caitlin is the most likely person that killed Mo. It just doesn't seem to have been as sinisterly planned as I think the prosecution initially presented. Now, finally, the jury ends this cross-examination with bringing out both of these guns and placing them in Colin's hand. Basically, this is to give the visual of Colin holding the gun and saying that he had purchased all these items, all the gun, the ammunition, and everything. However, it kind of backfired a little bit, in my opinion, because Colin showed just how unfamiliar he was with using Caitlin's Six Sour. For example, the defense asked him to show the jury how the gun lock works, and he stood up to demonstrate it, but apparently somewhat awkwardly. And the last thing that the jury heard Colin say before lunch was that he didn't really know how to operate the gun lock or load the magazine into the pistol. This is something that the defense really should have considered before acting out this whole demonstration. They may have been thinking that they were going to sort of stick the landing by ending with Colin holding the gun in front of the jury. But here they did a demonstrative version of what we in law will often call the one question too many. In other words, the defense here, in my opinion, reached a little bit too far to try to show the ideal perfect picture from the defense perspective, holding the six hour, expertly operating it. This, of course, is important to implant the idea in the mind of the jury that Colin may have been the one to kill Mo. But when Colin looks somewhat inept using it, like I said, in my opinion, I think this backfires. And that's the impression that the jury was left with before lunch. Not great for the defense. After this, like I said, the court had a lunch recess and afterwards Colin was back up, this time on redirect by the prosecution. Here, Colin clarified that when Caitlin came home on the night of May 11th, 2022, the night that Mo died, she was driving her black Jeep, the same Jeep that was caught on all the surveillance footage that we've seen so far. This is important because the defense on cross-examination tried to muddy this water a little bit by suggesting 
that it's possible that at some point, some other person could be driving Caitlin's Jeep. Anyway, Colin also clarified the issue of the blocked numbers. Specifically, he said that all of the numbers that he had blocked himself had been spam calls. And he clarified that he had told the police in his interrogation that he had found numbers in his phone that he himself had not blocked. So maybe he didn't say that Caitlin was the one that did it, but he said that he found them that were suspiciously blocked by someone else. And he had told the police that he had changed Mo's name in his phone because he wanted to maintain communication with her without triggering the old wounds that Caitlin was carrying. This is another good point to shore up for the state. And this is really what redirect is for. Sometimes when a witness is on cross-examination and the defense is drawing some blood, they're, they're scoring some points, sometimes it is better for the witness to just allow them to just happen and to trust the that the attorney that is representing their side, the one that did their direct examination, will come back on redirect and kind of clean everything up. And in a lot of circumstances, that's what the state did here on redirect. Now, the next thing they went over on redirect was Colin talked about the value of Moe's bicycle and said it was understated in appearance. He essentially said, you really have to know bicycles to know just how valuable it was. So this suggests that whoever took the bicycle out of Cash's apartment couldn't have just been some homeless person, for example. It more likely was somebody who was very familiar with cycling. Anyway, so then Colin was passed back and forth between the state and the defense a couple times, and eventually he was let go for the day. He was not released entirely as a witness, however, because the defense apparently wants the opportunity to recall Colin as a witness later in case something else comes up. Now, before we get to the next witness, I do want to address some out-of-court behavior that Colin engaged in. This happened twice on day four, first during the lunch recess, and then after he was let go for the day. The first time, he was caught on camera seemingly intentionally walking into a videographer in the hallway, and he seemed to be trying to knock the video camera out of his hands. I don't know how valuable that camera is, but I would venture to guess it's probably a very expensive piece of equipment. And then at the end of the day, when he was leaving the courthouse, he apparently came across the same videographer and again, went out of his way, this time to step on his foot. It's a little bit bizarre, I'm not gonna lie to you. In the video of the incident, you can actually hear the videographer scream in pain. Ouch! I'm not sure exactly what about the day was triggering Colin to engage in this kind of behavior, but it seems that something either about the testimony or the media attention or maybe the prolonged stress of being under the gun through this whole case and this whole trial has somehow gotten to him. Remember that his life has been turned upside down. He's lost all his sponsorships. I've talked about this so many times at this point. So, you know, he has a lot of reasons to have been under the gun, to have a lot of pressure and a lot of stress on him. So on the one hand, I can understand why he would feel the need to act out in this kind of way. But on the other hand, I think this is still foul and gross behavior. First off, unless there is some kind of interaction that is not presented in the video footage that has been put out on the internet, something about the interaction between Colin and this camera guy that I've missed somewhere, it seems to me that this guy is just doing his job. And second, and more importantly, this is a murder trial. Although Colin himself has surely been through the ringer, all of this eventually will pass for him. But if you look at the Wilson family, they have lost a daughter and a sister, and she is never coming back. So that empathy and goodwill that the general public will extend to Colin for the pressure that he's been under, it's only going to go so far if he engages in this kind of behavior. Now, as far as the outcome of this trial is concerned, I don't think it'll have any impact on Caitlin's conviction or exoneration. All of this was outside the presence of the jury, and they are supposed to actively stay away from any kind of coverage of this case, whether it is in regular media or on social media. So if they find out about it, it has to be after the trial is over when they can freely look everything up. But in my opinion, it really does matter in the court of public opinion. And I don't know if Colin has a PR rep, but if he doesn't, he needs to get one, like yesterday. And if he has one, he might need to get a new one who can properly shake him by the shoulders and say, look, I know that you're under a lot of pressure and you're tired of this and you want this to be over, but the sponsors care about their branding. Like, if you want them to come back, making these displays of yourself like you are some kind of self-centered asshole isn't going to make it happen. So keep it together when you're out there and, you know, go home and vent. Do what you need to do at the end of the day. Have a glass of whiskey. 
smoke a joint or something, you know, like do what you need to do that is safe and legal and behind closed doors, most importantly, so that you can get through this and then get back to doing what you love doing most. Anyway, let's get on to the next witness. This was Kenneth Allen Burroughs, who goes by Allen. He apparently is friends with Colin, although not particularly close. Allen was also friends with Caitlin, but I guess more so with Colin. When he was asked to describe Colin and Caitlin's relationship, he basically said that they were dating. And he said that he basically had the impression that Colin wasn't really that into Caitlyn. Honestly, this checks out based on what I've seen come out from Colin. Anyway, remember that on the evening of May 11th, Colin had a seven or eight minute phone call with someone. That apparently was Alan. That phone call took place at 9.07 p.m. They apparently discussed bike parts that Colin was going to lend to Alan. Alan said that Colin was at his home in the garage at the time of the phone call because they were talking about parts and Colin said that he was looking for them in his garage. Nothing about that conversation sounded out of the ordinary to Alan, and he said that he had no reason to think that Colin was lying to him about where he was. Then at 10 p.m., Alan says that he swung by for those bike parts. He said he could apparently see both Colin and Caitlin in the kitchen and that they both looked tired, but that he didn't interact with them. He kind of just came in for the bike parts and left. This does reinforce what the defense was saying about friends having free access to Colin and Caitlin's home. But again, how much of that leads to the conclusion that someone else used Caitlin's gun? Perhaps that's up to interpretation. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below but I personally don't find it particularly convincing. Anyway, the next witness was Lance Tyndall. Colin mentioned him in his testimony earlier in the day. He's another friend of Colin's and apparently much closer to Colin than Alan is. Lance said that he spoke with Caitlin on May 12th when he came to buy some wheels from Colin and Caitlin. On his way in, Colin was pulling out of the driveway and told Lance that Colin was going to the police station because someone had died the night before and the police thought she was murdered. Lance said that Colin looked shocked at the news. And when Lance went inside, he said that Caitlin told Lance that it was Mo who had died. Lance said that Caitlin also acted surprised and shocked about Mo's death as they talked. But an interesting thing happened here. Lance said that Caitlin brought up the Austin neighborhood of Cherrywood, asking if it was a dangerous area. Lance, who works in real estate, said Cherrywood was a safe neighborhood. Now, there was some confusion about this because apparently Cash's apartment was in the Chestnut neighborhood not the Cherrywood neighborhood. And Lance did say on cross-examination that often neighborhoods do get blended together. That said, it is suspicious that Caitlin would even know where Cash's apartment was to bring up any neighborhood. Okay, on to the final witness of the day. This was Detective Richard Spittler. Remember that Detective Spittler was one of the detectives that showed up unannounced to see Colin on the morning of May 12, 2022. The night before, he interviewed Caitlin Cash to get whatever information he could before going to the crime scene itself. Talking about the crime scene, Detective Spittler echoed what all of the other officers have said about it so far, that there were no signs of a forced entry or other disturbance. He also echoed that because Colin was the last person to see Mo alive, he was a person of interest and at the very least was someone who could potentially have some very good information. So they obviously were pretty keen on talking with him. He also said that in the early part of the investigation, they started surveying Colin and noticed that he was really moving around a lot. So they worried that he would be a flight risk. After Colin's interview, however, it became apparent that there was a bit of jealousy on Caitlin's part regarding Colin's relationship with Mo. And the thing that really triggered it for Detective Spittler was the fact that Colin changed Mo's name in his phone. So it became very important to Detective Spittler to speak with Caitlin since this was a potential motive. Then on May 13th, Detective Spittler introduced himself to Mo's family and asked if they knew of anyone that would want to hurt Mo. This is an important point to bring up because he said that although at this point they were very suspicious of Colin and of Caitlin, they were still looking for suspects. This of course goes against what the defense is saying, that the police had seized upon an early narrative and then pushed it from start to finish. Anyway, in the same conversation, Detective Spittler said that he asked the family for the code to access Mo's phone. This was so that the police could get her location data, her shopping habits, her missed calls, her texts, anything that could clue them into what was going on in Mo's life and could maybe point to who killed her. He said that he was able to get access to her phone by the end of the day, and as it turned out, this came in very handy. As Detective Spittler was investigating the phone, he found Mo's Strava app, which she used to log her rides. Now, I wasn't able to get much detail from the notes that I got on day four, but somehow Detective Spittler was able to see through Mo's phone that Caitlin had also used the Strava app. And more specifically, he was able to see that Caitlin had used it on May 10th and May 11th 
to find Mo's location. Personally, I would like to know how exactly he was able to see that. Perhaps he explained it in court and this part isn't captured by the live tweets and whatnot that I've been tracking. I've used Strava before, but it was only briefly and many years ago now. So I'm personally not all that familiar with it and how you can track someone else on it without for example, hacking into their phone. If you're familiar with it, let me know in the comments down below. But otherwise, my impression from today is that overall, Colin's testimony is supportive of the prosecution, but he's not without his warts. This is true both in the court of law and in the court of public opinion. Although, of course, like I said, the out-of-court behavior should not be impacting the jury in any way. And in court, I'm left with the impression that Colin is kind of a jerk in relationships. Maybe not a cheater in a traditional sense, but a little bit shady when it comes to, I don't know, maybe gratifying an ego with attention from the opposite sex. And those tendencies, I think, exacerbated Caitlin's already present insecurities, sending her off on the first train to crazy town. That said, it does not make him responsible for Mo's death, in my opinion. At this point, in my opinion, the defense has scored some points. They've stirred up a little bit of doubt, but nowhere near what they need in order to get an acquittal for Caitlin. We'll see what day five holds, but those are my thoughts. What do you think? Let us know in the comments down below. I apologize for how behind we're getting with these updates, but I do appreciate everyone's patience as I've been working to put these together. The comments have been so kind so far. This one was particularly long because I wanted to get everything in that I thought was important from Colin's testimony since he is such a key witness. Hopefully day five and day six are a bit more streamlined and we can get caught up by the time we get out of the holiday weekend for Veterans Day. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.